If you could try, picture the United States in the late 1880s. This was a time when there was only 38 states. The country was only 58 million in total population. Today, it's about 326 million. Only about a dozen cities had more than 200,000 residents. Today, we average about 1 million people per city. And the country's national income was only about $10 billion. Today, it's about $19 trillion. So it's safe to say it was a completely different time in not only American history, but in human history in general. Well, in in Chicago 1886, it's said that a jewelry store shipped some gold-filled watches to an unsuspected jeweler in Minnesota. This would lead to a chain of events that would ultimately lead to the founding of Sears. Richard Sears was working as an agent of the Minneapolis and St. Louis Railway Station in North Redwood. Sears' job was minimal, and he had a lot of spare time. To kill time, Sears would sell lumber and coal to the locals in the area to make some extra money. Later, a Redwood Falls jeweler received a shipment of watches that were unwanted. Sears saw an opportunity and purchased them himself and sold them to co-workers and made a good amount of profit. This seems to have sparked Sears' future in entrepreneurship, because in the same year of 1886, Sears began the R.W. Sears Watch Company in Minneapolis. Minneapolis. The following year in 1887, Sears moved the business to Chicago. He ran a classified advertisement in the Chicago Daily News, and it read, Wanted, watchmaker with reference who can furnish tools, state age, experience, and salary required. Address T39 Daily News. This led to Sears meeting Alva C. Roebuck, who responded to the ad. Roebuck told Sears he had experience with watches and even brought a couple of samples to prove it. He was hired on the spot, and this began a partnership that would make Sears and Roebuck's names famous. Sears, Roebuck, and Co., was born. When Sears as a company was started, farmers in rural parts of the U.S. were almost exclusively selling crops for cash to general stores. But due to huge inflation of prices by general stores, in some cases doubling the original sale price, farmers looked for alternatives to sell. And Sears, who was one of the pioneers of the mail-order companies, seemed to be the answer to their prayers. The company was the leading name in the new mail-order model by the time 1890 came around. They began sending out the very first Sears catalogs. Most of the early catalogs only featured watches and Jewelry. By the time 1895 came around, though, they had expanded to more than a 500-page catalog, now featuring shoes, women's clothing, wagons, fishing tackle, stoves, furniture, and more. Even though Richard Sears was very talented in advertising and merchandising, the aspect of organizing was not one of his strong suits. He left the organizing to Julius Rosenwald, who bought into the company in 1895. The company's reorganizing resulted in Rosenwald becoming the vice president of the company. While this was going on, Sears was sick and Roebuck resigned, although they kept his name in the company. Five years later, the company needed some capital, and Sears and Rosenwald for the first time sold common and preferred stock to the open market. The company has been publicly owned ever since. On September 28, 1914, Richard Sears passed away of Bright's disease. Bright's disease is a type of kidney disease that causes rise in blood pressure, among other complications. At the time of his death, Richard Sears was worth $25 million, which is approximately $611 million today. Roughly 20 years from taking the company public, Sears began to expand their reach. They were seen by many as shopping for rural areas only, and did not have as wide as a reach in big cities. Sears sought out to prove that they can compete in retail markets, and began a new retail takeover by the new vice president and chairman of the board at the time, named Robert E. Wood. Robert Wood saw that not only was shopping changing, but the country was changing as well. Cars and modern roads meant that a lot of shoppers were no longer limited to ordering by catalog. Just as important, Wood saw an influx of Americans that were ditching the farming industry and moving into factories and other careers in the city. In the year 1900, most of the country lived in rural areas. By the end of 1920, that was no longer the case. In early 1925, Robert Wood experimented with retail. He did this inside one of the company's mail order plants in Chicago. It was an immediate success. In less than a year, seven more stores were opened. Four of them were mail order stores, but by the end of 1927, Sears had 27 fully operational retail stores. The growing of Sears rolled on. By 1928, they had 192 retail stores. Later, in 1933, they had more than 400 retail locations throughout the United States. 
Despite the United States Great Depression of the 1930s, Sears continued with rapid expansion, and more than 600 stores were operating by 1941. Rapid growth wasn't halted until World War II broke out, and the war even forced some stores to close. To give you an idea of how popular Sears was, they opened a location in Havana, Cuba in 1947. Though it would later close due to shortages of World War II, it was the first permanent retail outlet from the U.S. to a foreign land. Foreign expansion attempts continued for places like Mexico, Central and South America, Europe, and Canada. In Canada, Sears purchased the Simpsons Company, and it was later renamed to Simpson Sears Limited, and later changed again to Sears Canada. If you want to know more about Sears Canada, Brightson Films has a great video about that aspect of the company, and I 100% recommend that you check it out. Looking forward to its expansion, in 1969, Sears announced plans for the Sears Tower. The new headquarters in downtown Chicago had 110 stories, and at the time of its completion in 1973, it was the world's tallest building, at 1,454 feet. It took 76,000 tons of steel, 2 million cubic feet of concrete, and 16,000 tinted windows, as well as 1,500 miles of electrical wiring and 80 miles of elevator cable to construct. Sears also continued to use their catalog model and dominated the mail order market with most rural purchases still coming from Sears in the late 1970s. The shopping mall boom of the 1970s made Sears even more popular, as they were anchor stores for most shopping malls. An anchor store in a mall is essentially a chain so popular that it drives traffic to itself as well as the rest of the mall tenants. Anchor stores are the principal tenants of a mall or shopping center and are usually department stores, often having the most floor space. Going into 1989, Sears would begin to feel pressured by competitors like Kmart and Walmart, which later surpassed Sears as the top retailer in the United States. The company began a campaign of price cuts. They slashed prices on most of its inventory at the time, and they lessened their catalog operation. They closed hundreds of stores, laid off tens of thousands of employees, and Sears stores began carrying more outside brands and accepting non-store credit cards. Prior to this, Sears exclusively accepted Discover credit cards due to a multi-year deal with the founder of Discover. Moving forward to 1992, the California Department of Consumer Affairs accused Sears auto repair shops of engaging in systemic fraud. Accusations soon were echoed by other states. The agency said that in nearly 90% of its visits by undercover investigators, employees suggested unnecessary repairs. Sears denied the accusations, but they soon had other concerns to address. In the next few years, Sears sold its portfolio of private label and co-branded cards, or company credit cards, which accounted for 60% of its annual profits. They sold it to Citigroup for $3 billion in cash, and the company later decided to relocate its headquarters to Hoffman Estates. At the close of the 2000 physical year, Sears had a huge 863 U.S. mall-based retail stores operating, most including Sears Auto Centers, and an additional 1,200 U.S. retail locations, including hardware, tire, and battery stores, as well as independently owned stores, were still operating, primarily in smaller rural markets. Nationally, Sears was also doing well. Their Canadian operation was one of Canada's largest retailers. Sears Canada operated 125 full-line stores, 176 specialty stores, and 1,550 independently owned catalog agents and hometown stores. In 2005, riding high from a Sears-dominated era, a predatory corporate takeover was looming. This began with Edward S. Lambert, a billionaire investor and Kmart's largest shareholder. He finished merging Kmart with Sears in a deal worth more than $11 billion, creating a company called Sears Holdings. Unfortunately, a few years later, the economy went into a downward spiral and e-commerce gained more traction. Malls and huge Sears stores, anchoring many of them, steadily lost their appeal. Sales at Sears, which Lambert promised would be unrecognizable in 30 years, were quickly tailing behind most of their top competitors. In 2013, Lampert became CEO as well as the largest company shareholder. He largely was overseeing the company via video conference and was criticized for splitting up the management into separate positions, which resulted in clashes between departments over company resources. Struggles continued and Sears moved to kill off some of its subsidiaries and shifted focus on Sears and Kmart at the end of 2013. Businesses including Sears Hometown and Outlet and Sears Canada were among those removed.
The predatory takeover I previously mentioned began to show in 2015 when Lambert engineered a real estate maneuver in which Sears, for $2.7 billion cash, sold 235 stores to Seritage Growth Properties. This was a spin-off company formed by Lambert and investors. For a time, that group included Steve Mnuchin, an extremely corrupt, well-known predatory investment banker. Seritage began redeveloping Prime Sears and Kmart locations into so-called more profitable, multi-use properties, while still collecting rent from Sears and Kmart. Kmart for stores that remained open. So basically Lambert shut down Sears and Kmart's best performing locations on purpose and began using them for things unrelated to Sears and Kmart. They clearly had no interest in legitimately rebuilding the struggling brands. The game that they played was basically they sold both of the brand's best producing retail locations. They collected the rent fees from all of the remaining locations. They intended to let the brands fall pulled back their investments once they extracted money from the company, and because they quote-unquote invested these hundreds of millions of dollars, it's in many cases no longer taxable, or at the very least taxed lower. This case reminds me of Toys R Us's bankruptcy. In the end, Toys R Us's liquidation was done to pay back the loans owned to corporate shareholders who extracted money from the brand, as well as pay back huge interest rates on those loans that could only ever be paid back by starving other aspects of the company. In 2017, they basically paid hush money to a shareholder who legitimately cared for the company and gave him $40 million to keep quiet about the clear corruption and conflicts of interest, which were among the shareholder's concerns. In 2017, the company expressed substantial doubt about its ability to continue after failing to turn a profit since 2010, and shedding brands like Craftsman and taking more than $800 million in loans from Lambert and his hedge fund, ESL Investments. Lambert was now increasingly described as a financial pirate. He was accused of stripping Sears of its assets, and then Whirlpool, a Sears partner since 1916, stopped selling its appliances through the chain in 2017. Today in 2018, Sears recently announced it would be filing for Chapter 11 bankruptcy and will begin attempting a company restructure. It seems today that Sears is yet another fallen titan of industry. They were the pioneers of modern retail and mail-order shopping the once most popular retail chain in the United States that later merged with the one second most popular retail chain in Kmart were simply not enough to tackle the predatory takeover by investors combined with the growing competition of Amazon and Walmart. Sears future is still uncertain, but it is looking like there's not much left for Sears or Kmart for that matter. I know a place. I know a place. Where life is good. Where life is good. A brand new place. A brand new place. In your neighborhood. Your neighborhood. Come to my place. Where dreams come true. Come true. My saving place can save a lot of dollars for you. My saving place. Here we go!